Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, understand when you're looking at this passage, there's several passages in the New Testament where you see these lists, all right? Romans chapter one is a, has a list in it. There's other places in scripture where you see the, these descriptive lists. Sometimes those lists are referring to the picture of the last days in the general culture just of itself. And sometimes, as I believe this one is, is talking about with, even within the context of the church, the walls, the, the gathering of, of what is supposed to be God's men. Paul is saying, hey, these are guys that are in your midst and you need to avoid these kind of people. So there's, there's, there's a, a very broad brush of just immorality and ungodliness that's painted here before us. And as you look at it, it's pretty descriptive of this moment in time that we're in. And we don't know the day of the Lord's return. The Bible says no man knows that. But the Bible does tell us that we can be aware of the seasons, all right, or the season of the Lord's return. And, and I believe, as we've said on many, many occasions, that we are poised right here on the precipice of the next big event, which I would believe tribulation and the rapture, which are most likely be concurrent. Those are the big events. That's, that's really all we're really waiting for is you look at the flow of prophecy in the end times. The many things have happened over the last few decades. The 20th and 21st century really marked many high marks within prophecy, such as the reinstatement of, to, to Israel as a nation, those kind of things. Now we're, now we're in this next phase that as the clock ticks down, the next big moment that, that the clock sounds will be, I believe, on, on the rapture of the church, the taking away of the Christians, and then the tribulation. But prior to that, and in the midst of all this, preceding those moments, there's this great move in the church. Remember in Jesus in Matthew 24 said, you know, watch this, you should know the signs and the seasons. And if you look at all of Matthew 24, it breaks down to about three areas. He talks about the signs of, uh, within, within the world, all right? You know, things like the earthquakes and the pestilence and the famine, which, which we see all that going on. And he talked about signs within, uh, within the Middle East, or the reinstatement of the nation of Israel coming back, possessing the land. All those things be happening. The, the nations round about them, gathering against them. We're seeing all that take place. We're seeing Russia poised for a great move like with the Battle of Gog and Magog. The third element, he said, was watch what happens within the context of religion and what happens within the church. And one of the descriptive things that Jesus said would happen would be a great falling away. The book of Jude is completely given over to this. You know, uh, First Peter, the, uh, Second Peter are, are given over this. Many places throughout scripture, the apostasy, the, the falling away uh, of people who really didn't know Jesus but pretended to know Jesus. Paul put it this way. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. They'll act like Christians, they'll talk like Christians, but there's no power of God in their life. They don't l truly live. Externally, before others, they perhaps they might, but not in reality, they're not, they're not committed to Christ. And, and, and this just goes along with a, with a recent article that came out just this last week. And you might have seen some of the talk show hosts talk about it, but it was released in New York as an AP news release. It was put out by the Pew Research, which is a, you know, is a pretty credible group that does a lot of religious research and studies. They said the number of Americans that, uh, who don't affiliate with particular religion has grown to 56 million in recent years. All right. They call this group in this research the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. You know, the, they have none. There's no affiliation. They, you know, they don't, they don't side with the, the church, the denominations, or Christianity. And they, the group calls them the nuns. 56 million has grown to. The second largest total in number behind evangelicals. So you have the nuns with no religious affiliation. Then you have the evangelicals, which make up the next biggest group. They went on to say Christianity is still the dominant faith by far in the United States. Seven in 10 Americans will identify with the tradition. However, the ranks of Christians has declined as the segment of people with no religion has grown. So they're saying that the people who make no religious affiliation, that number is increasing rapidly. The number of people who claim to be Christians, that number is decreasing rapidly. So between 2007 and 2014, Pew conducted two major surveys of U.S. religious life. Americans who described themselves as atheist, agnostic, or of no particular faith, they grew from 16% of our culture to 23%. At the same time, Christians dropped from about 78% to 
to 71% of the population. In other words, people who have not influenced by God and don't want any influence by God in their life, that number in America is growing. People who claim to be believers and the people who claim to, to know God and want to know God, that number is decreasing. Now that's pr- that is a prophetic sign as well that would take place of what Jesus described would, would take place even in the last times. The growth of the nuns goes on to say has great political significance. People with no religion tend to vote Democratic, just why white evangelicals tend to vote Republican. The Pew study found a slight drop, about 11% in the evangelical share of the population. And basically goes on and talks about some of the differences it will make in, in the political arena. This is not about politics this morning I want to talk to you about. This is about the church and where we need to be and what we need to be. And so I read over this whole survey and looked at all the ins and outs of it. I was uh, increasingly uh, in despair over it all and heartbroken because what it says without saying is this, the church is not alive. The church is not reaching the world, in America at least. The church is not growing. In fact, every church in America is either topped off or declining for the most part. Churches that preach the Word of God and stand true to the Word of God are increasingly declining because people don't want to, to be uh, addressed with the truth. They, they, want to be, they want to be stroked and petted and told how wonderful we are. So that, that number of evangelical churches is struggling. I would say even as our church, Believers Fellowship, we have plateaued in some areas. It's very, very disheartened to me as the pastor. I have preached in the last six to eight months the importance of us getting back to what God's called us to be, reaching the culture. Every church is going to experience people leaving. People get mad at the preacher. People get mad at the lift group leader. People get mad at somebody in the church, all right? People backslide. People get, you know, walk away from the Lord. People move. People die. So there's always this decreasing number, all right? So the church has to always be increasing if it's going to stay healthy and continue. It means we continue to reach out. We continue to restore, all right? We continue to, 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 to bring people into the family. And what happens when a church quits doing that and you reach a plateau, well, uh, any business person knows that when the rate of attrition becomes greater than your rate of growth, then you're in trouble. Then you've got problems. So what we seek to do and what, 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 what we have to keep our focus on is continuing to reach the world that God has called us to reach and continue to rise to the standard and be what God's called us to be and make a difference within the culture that we're living in. When we fail to do that, we begin to die. And the last thing we want to do is just become an old building sitting on an, empty, on a, on an old lot overgrown with grass with a few little folks who are family members, what are called, what I call the patriarchal churches, a few family members kind of holding things together. That's not what God's called us to do. It's called us to make a difference. Now, as I look at this in my own regard, and as I study our own numbers and look these things over, it, you know, it, it can be uh, frustrating. But more than that, I try to seek to make sure that it, it, beyond the frustration, it moves me to be more aggressive in my faith and more committed in my walk, and more committed to prayer, and more committed to reaching the culture that we live in. It gets back to the old hymn book. You look at that song, it said, I am resolved. That's where it should all bring us to. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. That's where we have to be. And that's what has to be our mindset. I'm going to run to the cross. I'm going to run to Jesus. Now in this passage, there's there's, there's so much here. We'll take a couple, two or three Sundays as we go through it. And in fact, he lists about 19 characteristics of the end times people. We'll try to cover six or eight of them today, all right? But first of all, let me just start with this, this terminology. He says, this know, all right, that in the last times, the last days, perilous times will come. A translation I shared on the board says, difficult times will come. Now those are two English words, perilous and difficult that just don't translate really good from the Greek to the English. It is a word which has to, to do with fierce, all right? It's the Greek word shalepos, kalepos in the Greek language. And it, 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 it's used three different ways. One, it's used in the Greek language as a medical term. The famous Greek writer Plutarch used this term to describe an ugly, infected, kind of dangerous wound. He said in the last days, the, the end times are going to be like a wound that's just oozing and it won't heal and it seems to be becoming infected and, and getting worse. Well, we know what those kind of things are like and we know the description can be a little gross if you continue to follow the flow of that description, but that's pretty much where the culture is. These are ugly days that we're living in. There seems to be an infection in the land which seems to be spreading and not be cured. 
All the things that we would boast upon about our, our tolerance and our love and our gracious to one another. We're living in an age and in, 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 a, in a time which is, doesn't demonstrate that at all. It's, these are difficult days. In fact, it's also used in the Greek language, not only as a medical term, it's used as a, as, a, as a spiritual term to describe a person who would be filled with demons. All right? The perilous person, this person that was used to describe, here's a guy like the maniac of the Gadarenes. You remember his story. And, and, and Matthew, where he's in the, in, in the, in, living in the tombs, he's destroying his own life. He's, you know, he, he has no concept of uh, moral authorities or he's running around naked through the tombs, cutting himself. It's, it, it, this was the terminology that would be used to describe somebody like that. Now, this is, this is also a good description of the culture we're living in. Without any regard for authority, without any regard for other people, without any regard for personal decency, we're living in an ungodly and an immoral age. The third way this term was used was an astronomical term. The Greeks would use it to describe it like when, when, uh, when uh, planets would collide or meteors would collide to the atmosphere and be fragmented and fiery. It was a violent time. We're living in those days. These are violent times. Most of Americans will tell you today to live in, especially in large metropolitan areas, that they're afraid. They're afraid of what might happen. They're afraid of the future. They're afraid of being a victim of a crime. They're afraid of being a victim of rape or burglary or vagrant. So just some problem that faces them with fears. The Bible says in the last days, men's hearts would fail them for fear. We're living in fearful times, difficult times. I mean, it's interesting. People say, well, how did we get to where we got? Well, other than, other than just making a mess of ourselves, I think it's pretty simple. When you go back into the late 50s, early 60s, and you see the educational system change. We now become interested in presenting a scientific view of man and humanity and creation. Instead of creation, now we've moved to evolution. Now, out of evolution can be birthed anything, all right? But what evolution of the 60s teaching led us to in the 70s and the 80s, what we call the age of enlightenment, it was just the age of humanism. Because if you're not going to center everything around God, well, who do you center around? Well, you center around humanity. And out of that period of time came all kinds of things we'll discuss in a moment. But that led to where we are today. I think we've gone from, from evolution. We've gone to humanism. And now we're in the, what I would just simply describe as the age of paganism. It's interesting, while I was studying this, I came across an article that was written by, in 1988 by an evangelical and a Christian philosopher and a theologian by the name of Carl Henry he wrote a book called The Twilight of the Great Civilization. And he made this stunning prediction for 1988, you know, for the years to come. Here's what he said. He said that as America progressively loses its Judeo-Christian heritage, paganism will grow bolder. What we saw in the last half of the 20th century was kind of a benign humanism. He predicted by the start of the 21st century, we would face a situation not unlike the first century church did when the Christian faith confronted raw paganism humanism with its pretty face ripped off, revealing the angry monster un underneath. That's where we are as a nation. That's where we are as, as a culture. And that's where Paul goes on to describe in this passage these different characteristics of the last generation. There's about 18, 19 things the way you, would, way you take it and receive it. But he lists these. And I want to kind of go over this list partially this morning and next Sunday we'll cover the other half of the list. Many of us, you go through this list of the 18 to 19 things, they're grouped in pairs, all right? And I'll, I'll kind of show you that as, as we go through it. So like when he says, in, you know, in the last days, men will be lovers themselves and covetous. That, in the Greek, that's written as, as a passage. That, that describes this one group. And then, he, and then he talks about they'll also be boasters and arrogant. They'll also be this and this and this and this and this is the way it's written. But it, let's look at the way, the way it's written out. And I think by taking a little closer look at what, the, what this passage says and even what the real definition of these words are, because it's easy just to read over it and not really think about what's being said here, but to take a closer look and see where we're at, then we'll start having a clear understanding of how we got to where we are. Because some of you wake up and say, how did we ever get here? I mean, I recently was listening to the news the other day when they were talking about this, this issue that the school board's facing in Fairfax, Virginia, you know, over this gender identification. They want to change this education to teach seventh graders, you know, about gender identification, well, you, that a boy's not really a boy and a girl's not really a girl, you could be either. And also, that's for seventh, in eighth grade, they want to move the, the educational teaching to gender fluidity. All right, gender fluidity means that uh, uh, you can be a girl today and a boy tomorrow. If you don't like that, you can be a girl tomorrow. Or you can go back to be a boy tomorrow. It's what, you know, it's a, it, it's a fluid thing. There's no such thing as gender 
you know, any, anymore. So you see, each generation and each year, it just gets a little more bizarre, does it not? I mean, and, and you see the extremes that it's going to. Well, I think as you discover what the Bible says about the end times, it becomes very clear. He says the first here thing is as they in the last days, people will be lovers of their own selves. That's a, an interesting Greek word because it's made of two words in the Greek. It's philo atos. The word philo is that word for brotherly love, like the city of love, Philadelphia. It's that word philo. The other part of the word is autos, which basically says it's, it's me. You know, it's just, it's, it, it comes back to me. And it's simply clearly means, you know, it's just a lover of your own self. You're, you love yourself more than you love others. That has become, as we said, out of evolution, moving into humanism. That's become the cry of the modern man. The contemporary church has even accepted widely and enthusiastically the idea of self-love. And it's become now held as a basic virtue. We need to love ourselves, love ourselves, love ourselves. And it all sounds good on the surface, surface but this is not what the Bible teaches. That's a corrupted view of what the scripture teaches. Well, they take verses like, well, you can't, you know, you can't love others if you don't love yourself. Jesus said you love your neighbors, you love yourself. That's what Jesus said, but what you said is completely different. You know, Jesus was making it clear that people are naturally love them own selves. People are naturally self-centered. So he said, what you have to do to discover real fullness of life is you come to the cross and you die to yourself. All right, then you can love others. Then you can love God. Then you can care. Then you can serve. But what we've done, we've just taken the truth of God, turned it completely on its head. We think self-love is the all-important thing here. And what you're doing is you're touting that self-love, which is the, pretty much the root behind all the evils of our culture, which is self degraded by sin, becoming dehumanized because of sin, not, not being able to qualified for, for anything because we're depraved in our own nature, we think that that's the most important thing in the culture. We realize, well, if a person doesn't have love for self or lack of, then they're going to lack self-esteem and they're going to lack self-fulfillment and they're not going to have positive self-images and the, and the churches embrace those kind of teachings. And we neglected what the Bible says. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, you have to deny yourself. Hello. You have to take up the cross, the point of death, and die there and follow Jesus. Paul said, listen, it's not I, but Christ. In other words, it's not about you anymore. It's not about your world, yourself, your life. I, I, after the service, I, I had a man that was visiting this morning to the campus. He was very distraught with me. Told me he didn't come to church to get that, <laughs> this message. And... Uh, began to tell me how he's a victim of all the problems in the world that are around and surrounding him. And I just said, you know, the problem is, I said, you know, it, uh, it's not that you, you don't love yourself, that you love yourself too much. And you need to give your life to Christ and submit your heart to Christ. And so and I said, I'm just asking him some basic things. Of course, he was very offensive and he wasn't going to hear much of anything. He was, he, he was very offended. And uh, so we basically just said, you know, if you're going to believe that way, then you're going to live a miserable life. But he, he had bought into this whole thing. It's all about him. It's all about me. You know, and the world should rotate around my axis, you know. It should revolve uh, that I am the center of this, this, of this universe. And if you don't help me, if you don't serve me, if you don't do something for me, then you, you know, I don't, have any, I don't have any interest in you. I have no interest in, 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 in this church. And again, unfortunately, the church has drifted into a lot of those infatuations with a self-love uh, mindset, which basically you trace its roots back to humanism. And that's where the culture is. But he ties to this, this, this idea of, of loving yourself, you know, at the end times, this would be the message. This is, this is, the, this is the way he starts it. The message of the end times is you've got to love yourself. You're supreme. But where does that come? It, when you embrace the idea there is no God or God, or God didn't create everything or we're not accountable to God or we're not going to stand before God and that God's word is not important or valuable, then that's where you come to. You worship yourself. You become the important thing. God's kind of off there somewhere if you even do believe in him. He said, but he tied that with not only will they be self-loving, and again, this is kind of compounded, they're self-loving, covetous people. They're self-loving, covetous people. Now, the adjectives of self-loving and money-loving, you know, uh, both have that same prefix as the other one did, that, that philo, you know. They, they love money. You could really say they love silver here. All right, that's, that's simple bottom line translation. They're materialistic people. Now, what does that mean? People say, I'm not covetous. But how many people in this world actually live with the mindset, if I had more money, I'd be happy. If I just had more money, 
You know, I could be happy. If I had more money, I could do this. If I had more money, I could do that. If I had more money, I could be successful. If I had more money, I could travel. If I had more money, I'd be in a better neighborhood. If I had more money, I'd have a better car. If I, and, the, and, and the dream is, is focused around how much can I get to make me happier? We've lost the concept that God might actually prosper me to be a blessing to others. You know, because again, we're driven by a self-love and a materialism that's really all about us. And no wonder, listen carefully, no wonder evangelism is suffering. No wonder missions are suffering. No wonder ministries are suffering because people, they're not going to give to those things if they're in love with themselves and love with their money. Say amen. Well, as we say amen, how many of you tithe? And again, we said before, that's just a baby giving start. Amen. How many of you give? Well, I can't afford to get. No, you bought into the lie. You bought in a lie that you're more important than God's will. You bought in a lie that you're more important than God's, God's plans. You bought in a lie that, God, that, that missions, evangelism, the church and ministry, those things are secondary to your needs. There's one, wait for more. We become covetous. And so how, much, how many people do we reach? Far fewer than we should because we're more into other things. Now, the second little coupling here he gives us is, is this word boasters, and he ties to it, we'll see in just a moment, th this word proud or arrogant. And the word boast here is an interesting word because it's the word alazon, and Plato used this terminology, and he defined it as a person who claims greatness for something he doesn't possess, all right? In other words, you're professing that you're something, Jesus said it like this, when a man professes himself to be something when he's nothing, he's only fooling himself and has become a fool. In other words, and he said, you're going to be living in a generation in the end times where people are just like this. They're boasting about gifts they do not possess. It's, it's, it's that prophetic picture from Jude and from 2 Peter and from the Proverbs where it talks about they are like clouds that promise rain, but it never rains. Now, we haven't had a lot of problem with that lately, but the issue is there, there's no basis in reality. They're telling you all these things they are, all these things they do, but they are not and they do not. It's this word, it was also translated as a vagrant, you know? I've met a lot of bums on the street who'll just brag and brag and brag about all they are and all they can do. I remember running into a guy in Belize one time, you know, he named me ever president in the United States. He wasn't even American, you know? And he wanted to borrow five bucks for a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> you know, but it, this train, this is the same word that's used in describing in Romans 1 the people whom God gives over because they choose themselves over God and they choose to love themselves more than loving God. It's, if you took the Webster's Dictionary, it'd be a, a des describing as a vagrant. Somebody just wanders aimlessly with no real visible means of support. And that, that's the way the world is. They, we don't look to God to support us. We don't look God to, to, to maintain. We think we've done everything we've done of our own accord by our own will and by our own intelligence. We don't realize all we've been given, that the very breath we breathe is a gift from God. We don't realize the very muscles that if we can exercise, that's a gift from God. It's the grace of God. And people become boastful and they think they've done something when they're really, well, the Bible says, Paul said, you're just full of hot air. Just full of hot air. You can't claim those things. When for the grace of God, you wouldn't have anything. But he ties it to this word, arrogant or proudful. So he said, he said they are boastful. And he says, not only are they boastful, they're arrogant. There's one word, but meaning he has no claim or basis for what he's saying. This word has to do with, with something a little different. It's the idea of self-centeredness that exalts you above everybody else. You, know? you, you think that you, you, you're, you're smarter, you're brighter, you're more intelligent, and you're wiser than everybody else around you. So, but that's the way people be. They just think they're smarter than everybody else. Isn't that the world we live in? I mean, I'm surprised to, 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 to watch some of the things I watch on TV, read some of the things you see in the media of people who make stupid statements and they think they're, and, and the world embraces them. It's, oh, that's marvelous. When they're not based in any reality, they're not based on any truth, they're not based on, on, on any kind of, 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 of scriptural truth. The word here is hooperphanos, you know? And hooper means always above, or it literally means to think yourself smarter than everybody else is what it really comes down to. Now, if you're smarter than everybody else, guess what? Nobody can tell you what to do. Nobody's going to be able to tell you how you, act to, how you ought to act. Like that, that was pretty much the guy that I, I met with this morning when he came up in and just jumped in the middle of everything while I'm greeting guests. It was, you know, he, he just, you know, well, I, he had all the information. He had all the answers. You couldn't tell him anything, no matter what it was. And it was like, why, you know, before I could answer, I would be cut off to give him a statement. He was an angry 
fellow, to say the least, you know. He was an angry, and it was, it was really sad. But I, I'm thinking, did you not just listen to everything I said? Yeah. You know? And then he went on to tell me how he was a victim of all the world's problems. You know, he's a victim of all his neighbor's situation. He was a victim of, you know, the economy and, and, and the health care system. His life was just upside down. And I asked him, are you a Christian? He said, well, I try to be. I said, when? <laughs> what do you mean when? I said, when do you try to be a Christian? I said, do you, do you pray? Do you have any kind of habit of prayer? Do you have any, do you have any pursuit of Jesus in your life? Is, is Christ important to you? Do you seek to, to appeal to him for, for strength and guidance? Do you, do you spend any time looking to the Lord for help? Well, I've done that sometimes. I said, the Bible, says, is the Bible important to you? Do you read the Bible? I don't read the Bible. You go to church. Well, I was here three years ago. Yeah. Why? Because we're smarter. We don't need people. We don't need God. We don't need the church. We don't need instruction. I don't, know, I don't need people telling me what to do, what I can't do, what I can do. And it really presents itself. And this is the flow, obviously, where this all goes, that I'm just, I'm above everything else. You know, that's different for me. Number five, he, he groups this with revilers with disobedient to parents. And this is the third pair that, that is coupled together. And, and, and this, this is also listed in Paul's list in Romans 1 about people who, who are given over God because they won't respond to, to this particular area. And it's the word which comes from blaspheme, this word reviler. It has to be about speaking against someone, against them. And the blaspheme is those two words, blapto, which means to hinder something, fame, which is the word we get for fame. In other words, we, we want to injure somebody's fame or status by what we say. Now we're living in, in this time in this culture when people love to mock the things that are righteous, to mock the things that are sacred, to mock the things that, that, are, that, are, that are holy. We, we speak against those in our world all the time. You can't watch a, a modern day movie or TV show if it has a Christian, that Christian is not a serial killer or a rapist or crazy, right? A child, a, a predator on some level. That, that's Hollywood and that's how the media portrays. I've watched Christian movies being, that come out like Noah and all these others. And there's, the way that, that Hollywood presents the word of God is ridiculous and stupid and, you know, and insane to say when you hold it up against the light of scriptures. And they, they make mockery of the things of God. I, I actually went to a movie this week, Kathy and I, you know. We ought to go do something. It's our 40th anniversary, right? So thank you very much. If I can't get you to applaud something, one thing, I'll get you to applaud something else. So we went and saw this silly movie, The Avengers. But right off the bat, I noticed in this movie, Captain America jumps on Iron Man for saying a cuss word. And throughout the rest of the movie, they're ridiculing Captain America. You know, for saying something about watch your language. And it's, oh, how stupid is that watch your language? Nobody watches their language anymore. Say whatever you want to say. You know, we speak what we want to speak. We say what we want to say. You want to get a real picture of what this word means, though, tune in to Bill Maher sometime on a talk show. Oh, yeah. You know, he's the captain in charge of this department right now of scoffing things that are holy. I never will forget a few years ago when Tim Tebow made the move from college to the NFL, the big press on him was that the issue that he was, he was still at the age of 22, 21 years old when he, when he gets out of college of 24, that he's still a virgin unmarried and still a virgin. Well, the media took this and ran with it and he was looked upon as a fool. And I tuned into a local sports show where they laugh at him and would mock him and ridicule him because he had, a, he had a standard in his life, a moral standard. And so they sought to defame him because he had a moral standard. Anybody that shows up on any secular program these days with a moral standard will be laughed at and ridiculed. This is the culture of blaspheming and defaming that which is righteous and that which is holy. Well, I want you to know Christians in, in America today, conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians like you are held in disdain in the culture that we live in today. You're not held in high respect. But according to this, he said there'll be revilers. And he ties it with this is interesting because it's also found that Romans 1, the disobedient to parent things. And it, it, there's this, you know, then in the Greek language, we've shared a lot of this with you about that when that letter begins with an A, it's a negative participle. Well, there's that, that egg, a, a, a word, like when theist and atheist, this, this word is, is attached to this negative participle, meaning without or to deny is attached to this, this, this primary verb called pithe, which means to assent to authority. And what he's saying here, there'll be people in the last days who will reject their parents' authority. All right. they, they will not assent to it. 
Now, if you look this word apithe up in a, in a Greek dictionary, it would say something like this. They are self-ordained. They're self-ordained. In other words, they choose by their own self what's right, what's wrong, what they will do, what they won't do based upon their own authority. In other words, isn't that the cry of the modern man? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. I'll say what I want to say. I'll go where I want to go. And, and, and in the culture we live in, that's described as freedom. The problem is you are not a free will. If you're left to do whatever you want to, you'll destroy yourself because you're in bondage and you're in bondage to your sin nature and you're in bondage to the world and you're in bondage to the devil. And he says, in the last days, there'll be people. And this is where it starts, all this other stuff. It starts in their home when they won't respond to parental authority. And if they can, they can reject the authority there and move out into the world, then they'll reject the authority everywhere. Let me tell you something, young people. You earn rights. You don't demand your rights. You earn trust. You don't demand trust. I've never had my kids even told me, you don't trust me. No, I don't. You're 15. <laughs> You're dangerous at 15. I was dangerous at 15. Some of you met the Phil's here. He was beyond dangerous at 15. <laughs> we don't, we reject the authority. And that word is used a lot in scripture, but it's also a sign of the end times. The Bible tells, even in Deuteronomy, God said, when you start rebelling against me, guess what? Those who are under your authority will rebel against you. In De Deuteronomy, I don't have it on the screen, 2832, you can make a note. It says, your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them. You're going to lose your kids to a culture. Deuteronomy 2831, they shall beget sons and daughters, but they will not enjoy them. Because we just let them do. Well, we, well Pastor Joe, I got to let them do what they want to do because I don't want to hurt their self-esteem. You know, I don't want to ruin their precious ego. You lose it and you lose the battle. No wonder we have runaways at staggering amounts. Listen to what Paul said in Titus chapter three, verse three. He said, we ourselves, we were sometimes foolish. We were disobedient ourselves. We were deceived. We served our own desires and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. <laughs> That's where it all leads. Tied to this word, that was, was, again, was that disobedient parent was that word had to do with revilers. You re don't respect our authority over it. You don't respect any authority and you speak against it. The seventh and eighth thing with this word ungrateful and tied to that word was the word unholy. Ungrateful has that, is that word uh, gratuitous. It, it's in the Greek word is akaristos. There's that negative participle, ah, without something, all right? In other words, and the word akaristos has to do with being gracious or to be pleasing or to be thankful. He says, these people are unthankful. They're ungracious. They're unpleasing in the end times. That's where the world is. Now, beautiful thing about this word, uh, this akaristos, it comes from that word charis for grace we get, like charisma. We talked about grace last week and week before. We, we, we shared with you how what God's grace is for us is that righteous influence upon our lives that frees us, that saves us, that leads us to repentance, that restores us, that delivers us. God gives us grace. We don't, we haven't done anything to, re, to earn it. We haven't done anything to merit it. It's just God's grace has flowed and it's influenced our life for righteousness. Now God in turn tells us to show mercy and to show grace. He said, but in the end times, there'll be a whole culture of people who will not know anything about showing mercy or showing grace. Men do anything wrong and the media gets hold of it. Even if you didn't do it wrong, you're hung. It's over. It'll destroy your life in a minute. This is an unforgiving generation. We don't know about mercy. We don't know about acceptance. We don't, we don't know about loving because it all comes out of that humanist mindset. It's, it's, it's about me and me only. I mentioned it in the campus. I said, you know, Kathy shared with me a, a clip the other day and she's good about doing that every day. <laughs> Show them, you ought to see this. It's from Facebook or you ought to see this. And, and, so, and y'all pass them around all the time, right? And it's, it's those clips where somebody does something honorable for someone. Maybe you saw the one about the guy who lost his dad, who was a police officer, and his young man had saved his money, saved his money because he knew that car would be auctioned one day, and he wanted his dad's cop car. So he saved all this money and went to the auction, because they always auctioned off the cop cars, to buy it. And a guy outbid him 60000 for this used cop car. 
God bid right off that six. And this guy, I want to say 13, 14, 15, 16,000 he had, and he'd saved it and put it all together. You know, as a young man, as a teen, I, I, want, my, I want dad's car. And the guy walks up, 60,000 to hand the keys, and he walks over to the young man and gives him the keys. Oh, and boy, that's a, that is so great. I watched a great story about uh, how they're, they're, they're making service dogs, you know, for, for veterans and how one of the prisons, uh, women's prisons, is you, they're teaching those women how to train the service dog for the veteran. I thought, that's a great story, man. Those are out of the norm. Remember a time in America, people look, oh, that happens all the time. Yeah. You know, people are always doing stuff for people all the time. Now when somebody does something, wow. Maybe you saw the story uh, uh, in, in Baytown the other day about a lady who had a flat tire. Did y'all see that story? Is in the paper, you know. She, she can't get it fixed, can't get it off. She looks like maybe something might be wrong with the tire. So they call for a record. They call for a cop because you know, there might be some foul play going on. Cop gets there and knows it's just a flat tire, so he waves the record off because he knows they're going to charge him $100. Pouring down rain. You know what the weather's like. He gets out and changes the flat tire, fixes everything. Well, that was Brother Barry Calvert from our church, all right? He's an officer in Baytown. <laughs> Those stories are great, but listen. In the last days, people are not going to be like that. That's why when they are like that, it surprises us. It takes us off guard. Wow, what they did for somebody else. And that's the life of the believer. If we're really on fire for Jesus Christ. He said, but that's not the way it'll be. They'll be ungrateful. If we're self-centered, we want somebody doing something for us. I'm needy. Help me. Give me. Buy me. Pay for me. Send me. I don't care about doing stuff for others, but he ties to this word, again, like this is the pair of words. It's this word, anososius. And it's the word, again, that negative part, part, participle there that starts it off, and they get this word. And it has to do with, basically, it carries the idea not so much of just not being like holy or religious, but it's the idea of being just indecent. But beyond that, it is gross indecency. It was, it was used to a person who refused to bury somebody who died. I just leave him there. That's immoral. It's indecent. It was also used amongst the Greeks to describe somebody who committed incest. And certainly this is the age we're living in. In other words, there's this unholy person who's driven by his love for his love for himself to indulge his own lust, whatever sort they are, as fully as possible with no thought for propriety, no thought for decency, and no, no thought for personal reputation. I don't care what anybody says about me. I'm coming out of the closet. It's the culture. It's the day and age we live in. But yet say anything against it. And man, you're going to be written up as, ah, he's a racist. He's discriminating. He hates people. You know, don't say anything like that. You can't say it in public. He's going to lose his job. We'll get him fired. He said something. He, used, he, he made it. And this is, people have no concept of what's moral and decent anymore. And we're introducing it into our school systems. I mean, you can't have a Bible club, but you can certainly have a, 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 lay, a, a gay and lesbian club. You know, we want to change all the restrooms down at Reliance Center. And they already have already started the process. We can go into, you don't have to go to male family, go whatever you want. You mean one, whatever you think you are that day, go in there. That's being now, as we said in Fairfax, Virginia, coming into the public school systems. No, no, no common sense. You know, I, I shared with our youth in a retreat last year. I said, if you're having a gender confusion... Go in the bathroom and look in your pants. That will settle the issue. Hey, I'm a boy. <laughs> Go ahead and applaud. That's worth applauding. <laughs> Wasn't well, silly to be heartbreaking, but it is heartbreaking. Amen. But this is it's whatever you want and whatever you like and whatever you don't care about what's right. Don't care about what's proper. I don't care about how it affects the children. What a mess. These are the last days. And no wonder the scripture says these are perilous times. Now we'll continue that list next Sunday. But let me simply conclude by going back to, to verse 1 where Paul said, This know in the last days perilous times will come. And that word is that word we've used a lot in Bible study around here. That word gnosko. To, to know by personal experience. In other words, don't just say, hey, I, these must be the last days. He said, you better take note. And you, you, need to, you need to personalize this. You are in the last days. You need to on an experiential level, realize these are the last days. Now, if the idea is not just to know something, but it's to know something so that you can respond to something, you know, it's, it's like what Paul says, you need to wake up. Wake up. 
Get your senses about you. Realize the time that you're in. Realize what's going on. These, this is the season that scriptures tell us. This is the season of the red letters of what Jesus said. These are the days we're living in. But unfortunately, all too many are, have bought into the self-love culture that we're living in. Let me close with this one verse here where he says in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar, they were men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. And the chiefs were 200 and their kinsmen were at their command. In other words, the men of Issachar, they knew what was going on. They realized where they were at. They realized how difficult the days were before them. They, were, they, they, they understood, they prepared the nation. We as a church have to also live prepared lives. We prepare each other, we encourage each other, we prepare our children, we equip them. We equip the saints, we're, we're on board with what God's doing. We, we take for genuine heart value, what we've said is our, our, our logo behind the, uh, under the lines of Believer's Fellowship where it says, for such a time as this. That we're here, right here, right now, not to coast, not to just point out how bad it is in the culture, but we're here to make the difference that God has called us to make. Paul said, be clear that you understand, that you know, that you know, that you know you know where you're at and what's going on. And we need to realize where we're at and what's going on. And we need to realize this is not a time to have dead religion. Like he said, those who have a form of godless, but they deny the power of it. We need the power of God on our lives. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reminded, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's like sitting on the airplane and the pilot comes on. This is Captain so-and-so from the cockpit. I hate to inform you, passengers, but we are lost. But do not worry, we're making very good time. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that pretty much where we're at? Oh, don't worry about it, it's gonna be okay. We're, 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 we're moving forward. We're moving in the wrong direction. We don't know where we're going. We're lost. One of the greatest things that the scriptures, you know, it, 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 five times in, the, in these verses, you can go back and look at them, that word phileo is used in, in the Greek language. For lovers of self, lovers of, you know, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Five times in those verses, he uses this word love, 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 love. One thing about God, our Father, that the scriptures portray him, God is love. And what, what, what about that love? God loves you. God loves me. God loves us. Now, what, what's our relationship to God? It's supposed to be a love relationship. I'm supposed to love God. He said, but all too often, as it says in the book of James, we become more in love with the world and more in love with our sin and more in love with things and we become adulterers and adulteresses. It's all about who you're going to love. Who you're going to love? Who you love? Love self, love pleasure, love the world, love silver, you love God. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I do not believe today that there's anything that I've, I've shared with these folks that they're not aware of. But I do believe what I've shared is what we need to be reminded of. So I pray, Father, in the holy and the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, that you would prick our hearts and our conscience and our minds to remind us today to stay true to you, stay at the cross, be fixed upon you. Keep our minds set on you. Keep our lives lightened up by your Holy Spirit and lighted up by your word so that we can be what you've called us to be. We can be life changers and world changers. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you would convict us where we need to be convicted. Convince us where we need to be convinced. Change us where we need to be changed. Work in our hearts. With your heads bowed just for a moment, if you're here without Christ today, I want to offer you an opportunity to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe terms you've heard throughout your life. What does it mean? It means you quit following yourself. It means you turn from yourself. And you turn to Jesus today. If you continue on the course that you're on, nothing good will come. Anything you experience will be fleeting in the context of joy or peace. But Christ will give you a peace that's transforming and life-altering. He'll give you peace with himself, with his Father, peace in your own heart, save you, deliver you, and give you an eternal home. I encourage you, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, that when we begin to sing this song of praise in a moment, that you'll just step out 
You'll come and take one of these men by the hand of the altar and say, listen, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to give my heart to Jesus today. Doesn't matter how long you've been in church, how religious you may have been, to have that form of godliness is not good enough. It comes back to, do I love God? Do I love Christ? He's my Lord and Savior. Give your heart to Him today. If you're a Christian, you see where the world's begin to influence your life. You begin to justify what you're doing because everybody else is doing it, so why don't you do it? When you know in your own conscience, your own heart, God steered you away from that. Come back to the cross today. Get your heart right with the Lord. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'd encourage you to come find a place to pray. Maybe there's just a burden you're bearing today. You just want to come lay it on the altar. But this invitation is a time for us to respond to the Spirit of God and what He's saying to us. So whatever the Lord has impressed upon your heart, would you respond today? So we worship the Lord, would you come? Step out. Let's do what God's called you to do. Come. Worthy is thou, Lamb who was slain, holy, holy.